The year was 1956. It was a time of innovation and progression. A young man from Tupelo, Mississippi by the name of Elvis Presley was about to change the music scene forever after a string of number one hits. Rock and roll was truly born, although Little Richard might disagree with that. De Stalinization had officially begun in the USSR and Tom Hanks was born. The super popular game of Yahtzee was also released that year. What a time to be alive. As for aviation, however, well, not so good. Planes were flying commercially for just 42 years at the time, with the first commercial flight back in 1914. Aviation risk assessment was still in its infancy when it came to flight safety, and the common issue of fixing the problem after it occurred was one that was heavily fixated upon as it would be for the many decades that followed. On the day TWA Flight 2 and United Airlines Flight 718 collided, however, it would change aviation history forever. Saturday, June 30th, 1956, 9.01 AM. It was your typical Saturday morning for air traffic control at Los Angeles Airport. Planes were arriving and departing, and everything pointed towards it being just another day at the office for most. Trans World Airlines Flight 2, a Lockheed L1049A Super Constellation aircraft, already 31 minutes behind its departure time of 8.30, departed the runway at 9.01 AM with the destination set for Kansas City Downtown Airport. On board was Captain Jack Gandhi, aged 41, First Officer James Rittner, aged 31, and Flight Engineer Forrest Brayfogle, aged 37, in addition to 64 passengers, including 11 TWA off-duty employees on free tickets, and 6 crew members, including 2 flight attendants and 1 off-duty flight engineer. Flight 2, initially flying under Instrument Flying Rules, IF-4, which relies on instruments to dictate the control of the flight, normally used in challenging weather, climbed to an authorized altitude of 19,000 feet, or 5,800 meters, and stayed in control airspace for as far as Daggett, California. At Daggett, Captain Gandhi turned right into a heading of 059 degrees magnetic toward a radio range near Trinidad, Colorado. Radio range was the main navigation system used for flights flying by IF-4. The constellation was now off airways, otherwise known as flying in uncontrolled airspace, which means the cockpit crew were flying without the assistance of air traffic control until they could re-enter radio range. 9.04 AM Three minutes after TWA Flight 2 departs, United Airlines Flight 718, a Douglas DC mainliner, takes to the skies with its destination set for Chicago's Midway Airport. In command of the aircraft is Captain Bob Shirley, accompanied by First Officer Robert Harms and Flight Engineer Gerardo Gerard Fiore. Also on board are 53 passengers and 5 crew members, including 2 flight attendants. Climbing to an authorized altitude of 21,000 feet or 6,400 meters, Captain Shirley flew under IF-4 in controlled airspace to a point northeast of Palm Springs, California, where he turned left toward a radio beacon near Needles, California, after which his flight plan was direct to Durango in southwestern Colorado. United's DC-7, though still under IF-4, was now, like TWA's constellation, en route into uncontrolled airspace. 9.21 AM Flight 2 reported that it was approaching Dagged and a request by Captain Gandhi for a change in flight plan altitude assignment from 19,000 to 21,000 feet was submitted. As was the practice at the time, his request had to be relayed by a TWA flight dispatcher to air traffic control, as neither crew was in direct contact with ATC after departure. The request was not approved because of the traffic currently at FL-210, flying at that altitude, and also due to the fact that by the time both planes re-entered controlled airspace, ATC would have no way in providing the horizontal separation between the two aircraft within an adequate time frame. 9.59 AM 
After its initial request to ascend to 21,000 feet was rejected, Flight 2 was granted permission to fly 1,000 on top. This is a term used to describe flying 1,000 feet above cloud level, which took the plane to an overall altitude of 21,000 feet, the same altitude as Flight 718. I found this piece of information quite alarming when researching for this video as to why the plane was initially denied an ascent to 21,000 feet but granted permission for 1,000 on top which resulted in it flying at that altitude anyway. After the request was approved, Flight 2 was still under IF4 but free of separation restrictions normally applied by air traffic control. It transferred to Gandhi and Rittner the responsibility for maintaining safe separation from other aircraft on the principle of the then termed see and be seen, more recently renamed see and avoid. To sum it up, the plane's safety was now fully in the pilot's hands. 10.31am Both aircraft are currently operating at 21,000 feet and have approached the painted desert line. This area is a desert of badlands in the Four Corners area, running from near the east end of Grand Canyon National Park and southeast into Petrified Forest National Park. The line was over 200 miles long and wholly outside controlled airspace, meaning although both planes were using IF-4, they incorporated VF-4 to properly navigate in and around clouds. As both planes were maneuvering near the canyon, investigators believed that the planes passed the same cloud but on opposite sides. Moments later, the two aircraft collided over the canyon at an angle of about 25 degrees. Post-crash analysis determined that the United DC-7 was banking to the right and pitching down at the time of the collision, suggesting that one or possibly both of the United pilots spotted the TWA constellation and attempted evasive action, but couldn't successfully do so in the mere seconds notice they had. The DC-7's upraised left wing clipped the top of the constellation's vertical stabilizer and struck the fuselage immediately ahead of the stabilizer's base, causing the tail assembly to break away from the rest of the airframe. The propeller on the DC-7's left outboard, a number one engine, chopped a series of gashes into the bottom of the constellation's fuselage. Explosive decompression would have instantaneously occurred from the damage, a theory substantiated by light debris such as cabin furnishings and personal effects being scattered over a very large area. The separation of the tail assembly from the constellation resulted in the immediate loss of control, causing the aircraft to enter a near vertical terminal velocity dive. Plunging into the Grand Canyon at an estimated speed of more than 700 feet per second, 480 miles per hour, the constellation slammed into the ravine on the northeast slope of Temple Butte and disintegrated on impact, instantly killing all aboard. An intense fire, fueled by aviation gasoline, ensued. The severed tail assembly, badly battered, came to rest nearby. All 128 on board both airplanes perished, making it the first commercial airline incident to exceed 100 fatalities. The airspace over the canyon was not under any type of radar observation and there was no homing beacons, cockpit voice recorders or flight data recorders aboard the aircraft either. The last position reports received from the flights did not reflect their locations at the time of the collision. Also, there were no credible witnesses to the collision itself or the subsequent crashes. The only immediate indication of trouble was when United Company radio operators in Salt Lake City and San Francisco heard a garbled transmission from Flight 718, the last from either aircraft. Civil Aeronautics Board, the CAB, later deciphered the transmission, which had been preserved on magnetic tape. As the voice of co-pilot Robert Harms declaring, Salt Lake, 718, we are going in. The shrill voice of Captain Shirley was heard in the background as presumably futilely struggling with the controls. He implored the airplane to pull up. After neither flight reported their current position for some time, the two aircraft were declared to be missing and search and rescue procedures started. The wreckage was first seen late in the day 
near the confluence of the Colorado and Little Colorado Rivers by Henry and Palin Hugden, two brothers who operated Grand Canyon Airlines, a small air taxi service. During a trip earlier in the day, Palin had noted dense black smoke rising near Temple Butte, the crash site of the constellation, but had dismissed it as brush set ablaze by lightning. Numerous helicopter missions were subsequently flown down to the crash sites to find and attempt to identify victims as well as recover wreckage for accident analysis. A difficult and dangerous process due to the rugged terrain and unpredictable air currents. Due to the great violence and velocity of the impacts, no bodies were recovered intact and the positive identification of most of the remains was not possible. On July 9, 1956, a mass funeral for the victims of TWA Flight 2 was held at the canyon's south rim. 29 unidentified victims of the United Flight were interred in four coffins at the Grand Canyon Pioneer Cemetery. 66 of the 70 TWA passengers and crew are buried in a mass grave at Citizens Cemetery in Flagstaff, Arizona. A number of years elapsed following this accident before most of the wreckage was removed from the canyon. Some pieces of the aircraft remain at both of the crash sites to this day. After a 10-month investigation into the accident and despite not having the advantages of in-flight recording that modern planes do, the CAB were very confident that they had accurately identified the probable cause of the crash and released the following statement which reads, The board determines that the probable cause of this mid-air collision was that the pilots did not see each other in time to avoid the collision. It is not possible to determine why the pilots did not see each other, but the evidence suggests that it resulted from any one or a combination of the following factors. Intervening clouds reducing time for visual separation, visual limitations due to cockpit visibility, and preoccupation with normal cockpit duties, preoccupation with matters unrelated to cockpit duties, such as attempting to provide the passengers with a more scenic view of the Grand Canyon area, physiological limits to human vision, reducing the time opportunity to see and avoid the other aircraft, or insufficiency of en route air traffic advisory information due to the inadequacy of facilities and lack of personnel in air traffic control. At 128 fatalities, the Grand Canyon collision became the deadliest US commercial airline disaster and deadliest air crash on US soil of any kind, surpassing United Airlines Flight 409 the year before. It was surpassed in both respects on December 16, 1960 by the 1960 New York mid-air collision, also involving United and TWA aircraft, a video I will be covering later on in the channel. The air traffic controller who had cleared TWA to 1000 on top was severely criticised as he had not advised Captain Gandhi and Captain Shirley about the potential for a traffic conflict following the clearance, even though he must have known of the possibility. The controller was publicly blamed for the accident by both airlines and was vilified in the press, but he was cleared of any wrongdoing. As Charles Carmody, the then assistant ATC director, testified during the investigation, neither flight was legally under the control of ATC when they collided as both were off airways. The controller was not required to issue a traffic conflict advisory to either pilot. According to the CAB Accident Investigation Final Report, page 8, the en route controller relayed a traffic advisory regarding United 718 to TWA's ground radio operator. ATC clears TWA2, maintain at least 1,000 on top, advise TWA2, his traffic is United 718, direct Durango, estimating needles at 0957. The TWA operator testified that Captain Gandhi acknowledged the information on the United flight as traffic received. As a result of the collision and several others that followed, especially between military and civilian planes as they flew in airspace operated by different organizations, the Federal Aviation Act of 1958 was passed, dissolving the CAA and creating the Federal Aviation Agency, FAA, later renamed the Federal Aviation Administration in 1966. 
the FAA was given total authority over all American airspace, including military activity, and as procedures and ATC facilities were modernized, mid-air collisions gradually became less frequent.